I'd like you to take your Bibles with me, if you would. Take the Word of God. We're going to go together to 1 Peter tonight. First Peter chapter 2. We're continuing this series called Continue. And it's been a blessing. I know it's been a week or two since we've been out of it with the wish year we had. Uh, Brother Holt was here and then uh, with Alabama Youth Congress. And so now we get back into it. We're on lesson six. I know many of you have the book there and you're following along filling in blanks. But if you don't, that's not a problem. You just can enjoy hearing the lesson from the Word of God. But uh, to me, we're back into the greatest, most exciting thing you can do in ministry. And that is completing the Great Commission as we disciple, mentoring someone that has trusted Christ the Savior, got them baptized. That can happen just a day. But then now, as the Bible says, go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever command you. And so that's what this is a part of, this discipleship. It is part of the Great Commission, and sometimes it's been a forgotten part. And so it's something that we need to be a part of. And so it's the joy of walking alongside one person and, and, and that relationship that's made with them and, and continue, helping them continue to follow the Lord and exciting to see, uh, almost like a, as Paul would call him, a son in the faith that Timothy was to him, seeing the light comes on as they begin to uh, understand from the Word of God and begin to trust God and begin to believe God by faith and see prayers answered and you show them a verse they've never seen before and it, it's new and fresh to them like it hasn't maybe been for you in a while and it's exciting to see God work. And so uh, you take them through this book that we use. It's called Continue, and, and uh, this is lesson six in that. And uh, the fellowship, the mentoring, the, the time spent together, the relationship built, as you just come alongside and walk with them uh, through this. And ultimately, you want to bring them to the point where now they reach someone else. They help someone else get baptized, and then they now mentor the next person. And that's what God intended for all of us to be a part of. John 8, 31 is the verse for this uh, series. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on Him, If ye continue in My word, then are ye My disciples indeed. So you come to lesson 6, and you're sitting there with your disciple that you're discipling, you're mentoring, and Jeremiah 33, 3 was the, was the uh, memory verse from last week. So you're going to ask them to quote their memory verse, call unto me and I'll answer thee, and, and show the great and mighty things thou knowest not. And then you're going to ask them about their week, talk about their family, but you're going to also talk to them about uh, church attendance, their prayer life, last time they committed to a prayer time. How's that been going? You've been praying every day at whatever time they put down. And so it's that accountability, that, that help. Like I mentioned, not everyone that joins Weight Watchers loses weight. But I would say a greater percentage than those that just start a diet on their own lose weight to Weight Watchers because of the accountability. You're going to have to talk to somebody, tell somebody what you've been eating and what you've been doing and exercise. And so this is the kind of the same thing, but in the spiritual way that there's that accountability, someone going along with you and walking together. And so you go over those questions and encourage them. Then you're going to ask the three questions in the front of the book. What spoke to you last time? Uh, that uh, what principle, or maybe in the devotional readings, or in your Bible reading, what stood out to you? And, uh, and uh, ask, answer questions there. Sometimes they have questions, yeah, I didn't understand this, or whatever, and you're helping them along. Then you're going to talk to them about, did you have a chance to apply? Uh, maybe that prayer time thing, as we talked about, or something, apply the truth or principle we learned last time, or share with someone else. And then uh, any questions in general that they might have, and you're going to answer that. All right, First Peter, here's our new lesson tonight, chapter 2, look at verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. But you notice verse 2 there. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. And the title of this lesson is your relationship with God's word. Your relationship with God's word. Now, the very first lesson in the series was on the Word of God, but it was on the fact that the Bible is true, and it is infallible, it is uh, uh, unchanging, it got, it, God promised to preserve His Word to every generation, and all of that, and so it was on the, 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 the Word of God is solid, it can be trusted, but this study is more the idea of our relationship to God's Word. Uh, yes, it's true. Yes, you trust it. I'm sure all of you, I hope, tonight would say that. I believe the Bible is true. I believe the Bible can be trusted. I believe the Bible is infallible. It's right. It's, it's unchanging. But doesn't mean all of us are 
allowing the Bible to affect our life personally. And that's what this lesson is geared towards, that we ought to have a relationship with the Word of God, and God intends for this book to be transforming in our life as a Christian now. And so you're helping someone that's a new Christian with this. Uh, God's Word's not just true, it's life-changing. And uh, we want it to be personal. So let's examine in this study how God's Word meets your needs, how you can access its power and wisdom, and how it will transform your life. Number one, God's Word can meet your needs. God's Word can meet your needs. You know, the Bible, one of the names of Jesus is He is the living Word. And so you cannot divorce Jesus and God from the Word of God. Uh, that's how He has revealed Himself to you and me, through His Word. I read this morning in Genesis in my Bible reading how God showed up and talked to Isaac there, and Isaac built an altar. God doesn't reveal Himself in that way today. But this is how He is revealing Himself today, through His Word. Uh, he doesn't show up and talk to us like in that same manner like He did in the Old Testament. And so God's Word points us to the answer. Jesus Christ is the answer. He points us to Jesus Christ and the Word of God, that's what it does. God's Word can meet your needs. At first blank there, the Bible is profitable for your life. The Bible's profitable. 2 Timothy 3.16 talks about that, how it has answers to guide us to every area of life. Verse 15, I like the way it starts, is that, that uh, um, not only in verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and in righteousness. But verse 15 says that the Scriptures are able to make the wise unto salvation. And that's where it starts. Now, this person you're dealing with, you believe that they've trusted Christ, they've been baptized, they're in our church, and now we're mentoring them. But I want to tell you here tonight, if you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, that's where God is starting with you. Uh, he comes to you as the Savior of the world. As He came to the woman at the well, He's that living water that wants to satisfy your thirst, bring the answer to your soul. And God says that we're all sinners we all need a Savior, and because of our sin, we're headed to hell without Christ, but Jesus died for you. Died on the cross so you can know Him as your Savior. And so the Bible is what tells us that. The Word of God tells us, Romans 6.23 tells us, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so He wants to give you a gift tonight. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, He wants to give you a gift. And the gift is eternal life, living forever with Him in heaven. What an amazing God we serve. And if we'll just pray and ask Him to do that, He'll come into our heart, forgive us our sin, and save us. And now the Word of God doesn't just save us, not only able to make us wise into salvation, but it helps us to live by it. Uh, he gives some things in the material there. Are four areas that God helps us is in doctrine. Uh, that's, it teaches us what to believe. It's reproof. It shows us where we're wrong. It's correction. It tells us how to get back on track where we're wrong. And it's also instruction, giving direction for daily living of the truth. My dad would always say it this way, doctrine is what is right. Reproof in your life is what's not right, <laughs> what you need to change. Then correction is how to get it right, and then instruction in righteousness is how to keep it right. That's an easy way to remember it, and certainly it's true as well. Then the Bible nourishes your spiritual growth. Not only is it profitable, but it helps you grow. You cannot grow apart from this book spiritually. You meet people today that's all oh, a very spiritual person. Oh, really? What church do you attend? Well, I don't go to church, but I, I pray all the time. I'm a very spiritual person. Well, I'm going to tell you, apart from this book and being under the reading and the preaching and the teaching of this book, you cannot be spiritual. You cannot be spiritual without being scriptural. And this is how we know God. And so the Bible is telling us in verse 2, 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. I don't care how beautiful the baby is. If the baby doesn't have milk, it's going to die. It won't grow. It cannot live. It has to have the milk. And they want it. They're after it. If you've ever had a baby, you know what they're like. They want mama and they're ready for it. You know, that's their, they have to have it. And they know it. And as a Christian, God's saying, you cannot grow. It's impossible without the Word of God. So he says, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the Word that ye may grow thereby. That's how we'll grow and be what God wants us to be. So God's Word is meeting our needs. as Our need to grow as a Christian and, trans, and, and come, comes through the transforming power of God. And then number two, God's Word should be in your routines. God's Word should be in your routines. So this is something like you eat. I like the routine of eating, don't you? 
Aren't you enjoy that? Aren't you glad you, that's part of your plan every day? How many ate something today? All right. Wow, some of you didn't eat. Very good. Uh, but you, we all, hey, it's part of our routine, isn't it? I wake up thinking about something to eat, and I go to bed thinking about something to eat. I mean, we, we like to eat, don't we? That's our routine, and God's Word should be that way. Spiritually, it's our food. The Bible calls it over and over, and it wants to impact us personally. So if we're going to let it impact us personally, we have to encounter it regularly. We have to be in it. We have to allow it to work. It's got to be part of our daily living. And there's several ways that God instructs us to include God's Word as a part of our life. First of all, the Bible instructs us that we're to read it daily. Now, I won't ask you how many read your Bible today, but I hope you did, because spiritually... You're famished tonight if you've not read your Bible in the last 24 hours. Uh, you're, 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 you're feeling a little weak uh, spiritually. You know how it is. Fast. You ever fast for a day and you get a little headache sometimes from that and, and you feel a little weak and you just don't feel like yourself? You know what I mean? Well, spiritually that's happening when you're not in the Word of God. And the Bible tells us we're to read it every day. Listen to Job 23:12. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. He's talking about the word from God's mouth. It's, I esteem it as more valuable, more important, more necessary than my necessary food physically. So one of the best habits we can develop is to set aside a time to read the word of God every day. Have a plan that you're going to do that. Not just a three-month assignment that you're helping now a new Christian. Don't forget, this is a lesson you're helping this new Christian. They have to read it during this because every week you're going to ask them and there's a plan for them, something to read every day. And so, But this isn't just for 14 weeks. This is something that you're trying to help set a routine and a pattern they're going to do the rest of their life. And that's the idea with it. And so they're to read it. But here's some helpful tips to reading the Bible every day. One, set a time. Many have said what gets done is what gets scheduled to get done. So you've got to set a time. It'll make it like an appointment. We have an appointment tomorrow for uh, Kristen and Chloe to have their, their annual checkup at the doctor. And um, they, uh, I won't talk about what they may get there, but I think some of you can guess. And so they're at that age where they're still getting those wonderful, exciting trips to the doctor. And so they, um, they are, are uh, it's an appointment. You know, we're going to be there. We've made an appointment. Well, you need to think that way about making an appointment every day with the Lord. It's an appointment. You have a place to be. This is a time with not just anyone. I mean, this is with the creator of the universe. Uh, this is an appointment you're not going to miss. Make an appointment. Make a time. Then, two, follow, God, follow a Bible reading plan. Have a plan. Know where you're going. Don't, don't flip through it. Oh, maybe read here today. or You know, that's going to be a dangerous thing. You've all heard the illustration about that. Don't, don't do that. Read with a plan. Read with a plan. I'd advise them as a new Christian where to read in the New Testament things. And that's, of course, in this book as well. Then ask God to guide you before you read. I try to pray every day when I start my devotion time. I usually pray after I read, but before I read, I say a short prayer. Lord, open my eyes. Behold wondrous things out of thy law. And that's Psalm 119. That's something that all of us, Lord, help me to see. Help me to see what you have in your word for me today. Ask God to guide you. Then ask questions about what you read. And I encourage a person to write things down. That's how you learn. You ask a question. So as you're reading, write things down and you want to help them during those weeks. Keep a journal or notebook and record verses that speak to you that the Holy Spirit applies to your life. Number two, not only read it daily, the Bible commands us to hear it consistently. Listen to Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Hebrews 10, 25 commands us not to forsake the assembly of ourselves together. And uh, so we're to hear it consistently. Then we're to meditate on it continually. Joshua 1.8, this book of the law should not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. But then, that thou mayest observe to do all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make it possible, and then thou shalt have good success. And so the word of God is to be meditated on. This book is to be, to be mauled on. This is to be thought about. And often God will give you a verse when you're reading time, and He'll bring it back to mind. It's a verse you need for that day. It's important. Psalm 1, 2, and 3 says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. What happens? And he should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth his fruit in the season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So, for every human being on the face of the earth, if they want to prosper, you want to have success, the only time the Bible even uses that word, be in this book. Meditate on it. Make this a part of your daily life, your routines. Of course, there's memorizing Scripture. That's one of the disciplines of meditation, to begin memorizing Scripture. 
Uh, Psalm 119.11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And a uh, great preacher of the past said, this, word, this book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. When you're not doing right, you don't want to open God's word and read it. But if you'll stay in this, he'll help you to do right. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So memorize it. It's a wonderful thing. During this time, you begin them memorizing verses. I just quoted several verses through this message. And that's because I've memorized them in the past. Well, in the very beginning here, one of the verses, the memory verse for this week is this verse, 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that may grow thereby. So you're helping them start a good habit here of memorizing a verse each week. But you're encouraging them. Don't, don't let it be just during this time. This is something you should plan on being a part of your life. This is a lifelong habit that you want to begin. You can point them to Appendix C in this book. It has different topics. You're struggling with depression, struggling with, with, with lust, struggling with whatever. There's verses for those things. And so that's a great place to point them to in their book. Uh, Philippians 4, 6 is a great place if you're going and have a problem with worry for instance. So here's someone struggling with worry. I just worry all the time and, and fret about things. Philippians 4, 6. Point, uh, that those verses are in that appendix there. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your heart and mind. So someone said it like this, Worry about nothing, but pray about everything. And if you'll do that, be thankful in anything, God says that you'll have peace the peace of God, even in the midst of trouble. Or you can take it to 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon uh, me, for I, for he, uh, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And so uh, both of those help with some with worry. That's just for example. Then study it regularly. The next thing, we're, the relationship God commands is we're to study it. In addition to your Bible reading, your church attendance, Bible memory, you're going to come across things in your life, areas of confusion. And you'll think, I don't know what to do, where to turn. And I want to tell you, the answer is found here. And if we'll learn to study the Word of God, well, I'm wondering about this question, what I should do in this. Go to the Word of God. God has an answer for you. And so you learn to study the Word of God. But you ought not just study it when there's a problem. You, ought to, you may not study the Word of God every day and dig deeper in Bible study every day, but I've planned times. I'm going to do a little study on this Word or something I didn't know about. I mentioned Sunday, the word subverting. Uh, there in 2 Timothy 2, and I was l learning one more what that word has to do with. And that's exciting to grow in your knowledge of the Word of God. Have times to study. 2 Timothy 2.15 commands it. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. And so it's not talking about study like this. We're doing a study tonight, and we call it our Bible study and prayer meeting, but it's talking about a workman. That means someone that's digging themselves. They're working at themselves. It's not a teacher feeding to the student, but rather getting in the Word yourself. You study it. You find that gold nugget in the Word of God. And it's more exciting when you find it, by the way. You'll love it. Then study it regularly. Study it regularly. I mentioned that. The next one is apply it faithfully. Apply it faithfully. The Bible is like no other book. It's like no other book. I said, said to the teenagers at Alabama Youth Congress, there's only one Bible. Said it to the guys, uh, yeah, actually in the split group, it was just to the men. There's only one Bible. I was telling Caitlin about this at home, and that's why I was mentioning it to them. You know, she loves to read, reads lots of books, and it's great. But I'm trying to encourage her to read the Bible. She's read it through already. I wish I'd have read it through already at age 10. That's thrilling. But uh, I was in high school before I read it through for my first time. Shame on me. But to read it through and to continue to read it, I was telling her, I mean, she'll read a book like this in a day. And nothing of it. She loves to read. And you'll see her around. I'm sure many of you have seen that. But I told her, hey, there's only one Bible. It'll be the same Bible 10, 10 years from now. Same Bible. 20 years from now. When you're daddy's age, it's the same Bible. If you'll learn to read the Bible and study the Bible, think how much you could grow and take in over these next years. That's something we do in our Christian school every morning. After Bible class, they have a choir, and then they have a time of Bible reading. Just 10 minutes. All the class reads one chapter together, including the teacher. And they, the ones, of course, that can read or at, their, at that level, but they, then they share. Maybe one or two of them share something, a verse that spoke to them. And we're trying to help them learn how to read the Bible and also let God speak to their heart and share something with someone else from their reading. And so uh, the opportunity there of the Word of God, there's only one Bible. If you'll learn to read and study this book, you'll be surprised just a little here, 
there a little, line upon line, the Bible says, precept upon precept, how you'll know this book and how to help you know God. See, this book's like none other. When you read this book, the author shows up with you. Now, he's always with us, but he begins to teach us. He begins to shine light on stuff we've never seen. I mean, the Word of God is amazing. And so, this is not a book to be questioned or debated, but it's a book to be applied and lived and obeyed. James 1.22 encourages us to this. Here's the command from the Word of God. But be ye doers of the Word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he's like unto a man, beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh in the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Do you want to have God's blessing in your life? God says, read this book and apply it to your life. Study this book and apply it to your life. Don't be a, just a hearer, be a doer of the Word of God. Well, what should I do tonight after, after finishing hearing this message from the Word of God? Well, the thing to do is begin reading the Bible every day. God wants you to be a doer. This message is all about getting in this book. And so make it an action, not just information. And that's what God wants you to do. Then the third thing, last thing tonight, God's Word will transform your life. God's Word will transform your life. This book is a transformational book. Now, I've read different books in my life, and uh, I had to read uh, books that were meaningful, that, that spoke to me. I read The Hiding Place, the story of Corey Ten Boom. How many of you ever read that book? And, boy, that's a great book. But I'll tell you, it encouraged me, it, it challenged me in a certain way, but it didn't transform my life. I've read lots of other books. I've read biographies, ones that were challenging, stirring, but I'll tell you, this book, God intends to transform you. Uh, that doesn't mean just change a little. doesn't mean turn over a new leaf. It, it has the idea of you going in like a slug, a caterpillar, into this cocoon and coming out a beautiful butterfly. It, it's a transformation. And the picture is that we go in as a worm, such as I, a, a sinner, uh, someone that, that is, is, is not what we ought to be, and God saves us. Then this book teaches us how to live, and we come out on the other end more and more into the image of His dear Son. That's what He's transforming us into. Well, Romans 12, verse 2 talks about that. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, God's plan for transformation of Christians is through the Word of God. That's what renews our mind. And it's to come from the inside out. God does His work from the inside out. And so it starts on the inside, and that's where we begin, the heart. And God works in there, and you start seeing changes on the outside. Because the image of His dear Son, the Bible says, begins to be evident in our life. Things begin to change. The way we act, the way we talk, the way we live, the choices we make, the things we do, because Jesus Christ is living His life through us. And that's the idea. God's Word will transform your life. God's Word is to be so much a part of our lives particularly our thinking that it is like a branch engrafted into a tree. James 1.21 talks about that. There are many ways that God's Word can transform our lives. Notice these three. First of all, understanding. The Bible increases our understanding, our knowledge of God. We don't read God like a text, or read the Bible like a textbook. We read it to know the Lord. We're to look for Him on every page. We're to look for Him in every book. He's there. His hand is at work, and God will speak to us all the way through it. And so it's not for information, it's to know a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, what an opportunity. Understanding, then obeying. The Bible produces Christ-like maturity. When you become a Christian, you're born again. You're born into the family of God. But from that point forward, God desires to, you to get on this spiritual path, walking in Jesus' steps, in step with the Lord Jesus and doing as He would do. Have this mind, let this mind be within you, which was also in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So as we behold the Lord in His Word, the Spirit of God at work in our life, we begin to be changed more and more into His image. And that's God's plan for you. If, if we were to look at you 10 years from now compared to how we see you today spiritually, 
Ten years from now, we ought to see Jesus Christ way more on your life. Ten months from now, we ought to see Jesus Christ more on your life. That's what God intended. If, if we could back up ten years and see you, if you were saved ten years ago, how you look today spiritually ought to be way more like Jesus Christ. That's what God's plan. That's how He intends it, it, it to be as a Christian. And this is how He intends to do it, through His Word. And so may the Lord help us. You say, well, I'm getting older. I don't look like I used to look. Well, spiritually, you can look better and better like Jesus Christ. And so what a privilege that is. Then, the last thing is God intends us to have continued use. Continued use of the Bible produces spiritual discernment. As you read and study this book, you begin to see differently. You begin to see this world differently. You begin to see certainly God differently. You begin to see you differently. You begin to see others, people around you differently. You begin to see material things differently. Uh, turn with me to Hebrews, would you? We'll go to Hebrews chapter 5. We'll leave First Peter. That's where we'll end. Hebrews chapter 5. And Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 13. Let's just see what it says. Always remember that the goal of reading, studying, memorizing God's Word is not merely knowledge. The goal is transformation. So it's an active agent on your life. It's not a, just for information's sake. You hear Hebrews 5, you're there, verse 13. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. There's some baby mistakes that happen. You have children, you'll find some childish mistakes that take place. Uh, you see adolescent mistakes in their teenage years. You see even young adults making mistakes and I've been there. Even young married couples making mistakes. We've been there. But as you grow and continue to grow, it doesn't mean you don't ever make mistakes as you get older, but you start to be able to have more discernment in life, physically I'm talking about. Well, God's saying, as you will stay in this book, you don't have to be old to have spiritual discernment. You don't have to be saved 20 years. Here he's writing, and people that they're writing to, and Paul would often write to, and here's writing these Christians and Hebrews, they may have only been saved two or three years. Four or five years. These aren't necessarily people who have been saved for 50 years or 40 years, but they have gotten in the Word of God. And by reason of use, by studying and memorizing and meditating and knowing the book, they have become spiritually full age. Discernment has come into their life. They are now mature as a Christian and they can discern things. They're not falling prey to every wind of doctrine as, as Paul would write. This is something that they have grown from a babe in Christ. Always remember, the goal is transformation. A growing Christian will always be able to point to recent transformation in their life that has come about by the Word of God. When someone says, hey, give a testimony about what God's doing, or someone, friend asks you, what's God doing in your life? We shouldn't only be able to go back to one day back 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 10 years ago when you got saved. I thank the Lord for that day. That's wonderful. It all began there. But it ought to be active in your life. God ought to be doing something right now in your life. Uh, this past week, you ought to be saying, oh yeah, God spoke to me from His Word, and God's working on me in this, and this past month, God... And just today when I was reading, it ought to be an active thing. If you can only go back to somewhere way back when, when God did something when you got saved, hey, that's not what God intends. This is a daily walk with Him. In a day-by-day -day relationship with Him. And so don't miss out on what God, all that God gave us in salvation. Well, conclusion, you bring them to the application of the lesson. So you're ending your lesson one-on-one -on -one with a person and you ask them for, to make a decision now based on what they know from the Word of God to be true about how they're about to be involved in the, every, daily, every day of their life in the Word of God. So the first thing is, set a regular time for reading your Bible. So you're going to ask them, uh, make a time, a daily time. You're going to encourage them. Now, remember you made a time last week on, to pray every day, so let's include this in that same time. And let's have a time to read God's Word. All right, go ahead and write it in there. What time are you going to do it? And so we're getting specific. Nothing's dynamic till it's specific. So let's make it personal. Let's make it specific. When are we going to do it every day? And they, they, they make that plan that week. Then, so next week, you're going to look at what they decided. Or if maybe they know right then, they can write it in. Then number two, develop a habit of applying God's Word. Encourage them to ask, get in the habit of asking themselves the question, how can I apply what I've just read to my life today? How can I apply this today? 
Well, obviously, if you read 1 Peter 2, 2 today, you could say, as newborn babes, as I have the sincere milk of the word, they may grow thereby. I need to read the Bible so I can grow, so I can apply that to my life. But so you're going to help them develop a habit of not just reading the Bible and checking something off, but I want to get something from God today. I want to be more in Christ's image by the time this day ends. In my Bible time today, I want to learn something, how I can look more like Jesus in my life. Then, make Scripture memory an ongoing practice in your life is the third application. And some people say, well, I'm too old to memorize, you know. Well, that's not really true. We all know our phone number, and most of the time, you know, you know our address. We, we know, we, we memorize certain things. You might be able to name some players on the Alabama football team or Auburn or wherever you cheer for. You know, we, we can memorize. So we all can do it. It may take more work, but you keep saying it, keep it in your pocket, and, and to keep repeating it over and over, and have it on a card or something, and keep saying it. You know, as newborn babes, desire the essential milk, and repeat it, repeat it to yourself, repeat it to your wife, you know, and, uh, and, and it'll help you. You'll, you can memorize. Everybody can. You may not memorize as quick as some little kid, these young, sharp minds, but you can. We all can. And uh, some of you can still tell me, uh, your military ID number from way back when, or things like that, you can memorize. And so all of us ought to be a part of Scripture memory. Well, 1914, Ernest Shackleton and a team of explorers set out from England. They set out to do something that no one had ever done. Cross Antarctica through the South Pole from one side to the other. No one had ever done it. Well, disaster struck. The team ship named Endurance became entrapped in the ice, and eventually it sank. And here they are. Hall was crushed, the hull of the ship. They're marooned on a nearby island called Elephant Island. Seemed like very little chance they're going to survive. It's 1914, they didn't have a cell phone, you know. Uh, this, this, was, this was serious. When a desperate effort to get help, Shackleton, the captain, said, let's, let's get on this lifeboat and go for help. The nearest place to go was South Georgia Island. So him and five others get on a 20-foot raft, lifeboat, and head out 800-mile journey to George Island. All they had was a compass and something they called back then a sextant. Anyone know what that is? Okay, a couple of you. Yeah, it's a thing that has a 60-degree angle. It helps you to know. I have no idea how to use it. Don't ask me. But the captain's name, uh, Frank Worsley, who had captained the Endurance, navigated their course all the way. 800 miles. They went over waves that were 100 feet high. This is some of the stormiest waters in the world. Can you imagine that on a 20-foot raft, 100-foot high waves? They got back, got to South Georgia Island, got a ship, navigated their course back to all the men that were stranded there and rescued all of them. None of them died. They were come back to England. They were heroes all over England for their courage and persistence. So what's the point? Well, all of us are making our way through a stormy world. Ever since the Garden of Eden, mankind has struggled to make wise decisions about uncertain future. And certainly we can look around in our nation, we can look around in our lives, our families, there's uncertainty abounds. The only way to ensure we don't go astray is we have an objective compass, an objective guide to guide us in this course Truth that will guide us. Just like the compass guided those sailors home, this will guide you. No matter someone's advice, no matter the circumstance, God's work can guide us through uncertain and difficult circumstances if we'll trust it. Trust it over your feelings. You ever feel like to do the wrong thing? I certainly have. You ever feel like you should give someone a piece of your mind? Yeah, I certainly have, right? Trust it. Trust it over our own wisdom. My mom's life first come to mind, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He'll direct thy paths. Trust the Word of God over contrary advice that others may give. We've all probably gotten bad advice in the past. But see, the Bible is inspired by God. And because it is, you can trust it. It's a compass. Even guys on a raft, I don't even know how to use a compass in this sextant thing, but they found... Can you imagine a small island 800 miles away, how easy it would be to miss it, and he guided them right to it? This book is true like that. Amen. This book will guide you to the Lord. He's the one that will lead us home. And so that's our opportunity as we think of leading people in through discipleship, of helping them, pointing to the answer.
or whatever they're dealing with, the struggles, the habits, the past, as a newly saved person is trying to go through. Well, let's bow our head in prayer.